everybody, your favorite professor here. Just wanted to, oh, keep doing that. I think that's the everyday normal now. So we're gonna finish up with the life course perspective of gerontology, and we're gonna get more into the, the science of it the, and building upon the theories and the research methods. As last time, we really highlighted just the trends and the terminology in gerontology. So let's get at first the theory. So why do we need these theories? Why does science start from these theories? So if you think about it, let's think about it like this. There's so much evidence going on, right? There's so many things that are found in the world, so many research that finds certain things. Uh, so a theory, what it is, it's like a housing, right? It houses all of this knowledge into kind of one, one package, right? One theory, and these theories have certain set of assumptions, and these assumptions are how we generate questions that are interesting, along with them being testable. And testableness of these theories are what is the, the backbone of whether they go forward through the scientific process or whether they go backwards or they get refined. So one of the theories that really highlight the life course perspective that we are taking in this class is continuity theory. And continuity theory is this more traditional theory that, that, that pretty much suggests that what we do earlier in the lifespan really impacts what we do later in the lifespan. So we have similar habits, we have similar personalities and activities, and they're generally the same, but they just morph a little during the development process. And if we think of an example, if you guys remember Jack Elaine, right? He was this like super fit guru uh, in his younger days, and now he, well, he's dead now, RIP, it's too soon. But <laughs> essentially, he was also, in the later ages, he was this big guru as, well, health, uh, fitness guru. But however, there are certain things that happen to us when we are older that uh, may, might change how we act, right? Maybe when we are younger, we, when we're younger, we're like, yeah, let's party and let's get through and do everything and meet all new people. But this is, this is somebody partying. But as we go older, generally, right, social circles start to shrink, right? From these big circles to less, to a little more smaller circles. And continuity theory might suggest that, no, this is us wanting to be around the people that we want to be around. You know, and this uh, this also coincides with uh, social emotional selectivity theory, which we'll get down later on. But essentially, this is what continuity theory is, right? What you do earlier in your life plan really reflects uh, similarities to later in the lifespan. And what activity theory is like? These are similar. Uh, things, right? The, the, what you do, you don't just develop a certain interest later in life, right? These have, er, something early in life really has a bearing on that. That is the continuity theory. The next broad lifespan theory, and what is my personal favorite, is a Theory of Psychosocial Development by Eric Erickson. This was one of the first theories to postulate that development just doesn't occur and stop earlier in life. People used to think once you turn 18, 21, boom, that was the person you were going to be. But Eric Erickson came up with this theory of psychosocial development to connect the whole lifespan because we do develop new new needs, new sense of ourselves in middle and later life as well. And this theory of psychosocial development really shows that, well, postulates that the beginning of life really dictates how we see life, you know? So when you're an infant, you start to develop these capacities of trust or not. 
Uh, does somebody actually change your diaper when you start crying, right, most of the time? So you develop this capacity to trust or not. And if you don't develop that really early, according to this theory, it really impacts subsequent stages. But what people don't think about, and I guess what gets misconstrued, is that you can't, even though you can, obviously we can't go back into infancy, you know, those people that go back into the womb and goes through those new age therapies, uh, you can work on that, right? These are epigenetic, meaning you could build that trust later in life. It's just going to be harder, right? You might develop these trust issues. But essentially what this theory really highlights is that what happens earlier in life really impacts what who we have become in older adulthood. And when we talk about older adulthood, there is this, there's this, uh, this conflict, right? Th let's go back at the, the end of life of ego integrity versus ego despair. So it's just looking back at your life and seeing, whoa, was my life worth it? Did it have some meaningfulness to it? Because some people who go through maybe ego despair, they might say, oh, life is so pointless. My life is so pointless. Why did that happen to me? While people who have a high sense of ego integrity would be more like, oh, wow, that's, uh, that, that happened for a reason. You know, like the, the famous Facebook quotes that people have in their profiles. But they start to see this coherency in their life. You know, things happened and this led you to this path. And you wouldn't trade that for the world, your life you live, the good and the bad. The, the, the coherency, right? The coherency is the important thing, right? It's, it, things happen to our lives, the good, the bad, it's that coherency that matters. And even just before that, right, in adulthood, we go through this period of generativity versus stagnation. Uh, whether you want, generativity meaning if you made a difference in somebody's life or not, or a difference in impacting the next generation. Did you leave your mark, right? We have these generative needs and we have these generative aspirations. Uh, if you don't meet those needs or you don't feel like you contributed to society, you would call what we call stagnate, right? And we will get through this to the, the other parts of the, the later parts of the semester, but this is when the stagnation, when you feel like you are not going anywhere in life, you haven't contributed, you didn't, this is not the career you wanted, this is not the wife or, or, or spouse you wanted, right? We go, you see this, these people go through the midlife crises that we will, we will get through. So in general, this is the theory of psychosocial development, right? What happens to us earlier in life really impacts us later in life. And with the ultimate goal later in life to see this coherency in one's life. The other traditional theory that we see in uh, older adults, uh, that we frame for older adults is this disengagement theory. Meaning that older adults, they stop going like out, you know, they start, they stop exploring all these new things and they start going, working towards themselves, right? They start going, what is called interior, right? They start thinking, oh, they start worrying about the things that they want to be worrying about. So they start, this theory postulates that you distance yourself away from the general society. And this gradual, this gradual di uh, distancing is both behaviorally of like, oh, I don't want to go to that party. I don't care about meeting new people. To psychologically, you know, you want to work on certain crafts that you uh, really want to work on. And there's this like mutual separation, right? Meaning society maybe not doesn't want you in everything as well because you don't want to be there, right? This kind of self-fulfilling prophecy along with the you're trying to just deal with your inner concerns, right? The, do you feel like, oh, you're working on yourself? Do you feel comfortable with yourself and working on those issues? And the, the, but know that there is a difference between withdrawing from society than being isolated. Uh, 
similarly, we could feel like, just know that there is a difference though, being withdrawn for society and being like isolated. Being isolated is one of the most uh, harmful things for older adults. They, there's a couple of uh, research studies that suggest that isolation is like smoking 15 packs of cigarettes a day. That's how harmful it is. So the difference between isolation and being alone, being alone is more about uh, your feeling, right? You, you're, you're, you're not with anybody. While feeling isolated is literally being like objectively, you know, you don't have contact with people. It's hard for you to get that social contact, right? That isolation is more objective and subjective is that is that alone, right? You might feel lonely and that lonely could, you could all be in a crowd like that, right? And everybody's on their phone and you just might feel lonely, but there might be people around you. That's a, the more subjective experience. Well, isolation is more this harmful, uh, objective piece of that. So those are just some of the, the more traditional theories on aging and mostly from the psychological perspective, there are so many more. I just highlighted those ones because we will be using them throughout our semester. But for the more contemporary theories, uh, we first start with this productive aging. Like I said before, beyond just people living longer than ever, they are more and more uh, mobile, functioning, and healthier. They're lasting longer. They're functioning longer than ever. So this productive uh, aging theory postulates that we keep active, right? We, we stay active and remain active because this is part of like who we are, right? We engage in these activities to be productive and productivity is a very psychological concept because what you might see one person seen as productive, like watching their kids, uh, others might be like, oh wow, I'm just wasting my time not making money. Or somebody working at McDonald's might, somebody might be seen as productive but others might be like, oh, why are they wasting their time? So this productivity is a very subjective psychological experience. And it comes in all these many forms. And we see this as like this keeping busy. You know, what do people do to remain busy? And a lot of what older adults do is volunteer, right? Engage in this civic activity, civic engagement. And essentially they engage in these activities to help the bigger community that they are a part of. So, uh, or general society. So this is, and you see a large portion of older adults do this. So moving on to successful aging, this is one of the most contemporary and uh, controversial-ish kind of theories to map out what does it mean to age well? And this was created in the 1980s and really took off in the 90s with a uh, Rowan Kahn's uh, a framework of what does it mean to age successfully and what it means is the they found from this was all evidence provided from these MacArthur studies that were done that there are three pretty much criteria according to this theory of successful aging of being uh, doing aging well and First one is the absence of disease and disability, right? You're still, you're, you have uh, no disease or disability. I guess it's self, pretty self-explanatory. And the, the second criteria would be this high functioning in a physical and cognitive ability, right? Are you, beyond just being absence of disease, you're able to function at a, a level that is uh, productive along with this more engagement, right? Being engaged with life. And this has to deal with like social and uh, productive activities. So these are criteria, but it's very controversial because most people, right? Especially with this modern medicine, right? They are not necessarily absence of disease or disability, right? Most people, right? Especially at uh, 70 plus, they have a mor morbidity, 
You know, most people have, are diagnosed with maybe, especially in the U.S., high blood pressure, hypertension, some type of uh, cholesterol uh, issue, which would be morbidity, which would take them out of that successful aging framework or, or, or uh, designation. So in response to Rowan Khan's successful aging, because not everybody could age successfully because most people are have some type of disease or disability, they uh, Baltus and Baltus came up with this optimal aging framework, and this was all about adaptability, right? Sir, we are more likely to develop these uh, diseases over as we age. However, the the key is to adapt to them, and the adaption is what makes somebody age successfully and this SOC model right is how we that was is how Bal Paul Baltus uh, really conceptualized this and we do this through three steps general steps first is through selection right being able to select certain activities that we want to optimize right get good at and we compensate for loss right we select these certain activities and you compensate and you get good at it and you compensate for the losses that you might experience with age. So think of just Kobe, is it? I know it's too soon, I know, but I'm not a Laker fan, so I'm gonna talk about it. <laughs> so just in general, all, all these professional athletes, you see them, especially in basketball, they become like high energy dunkers, right? They start to use just their physical prowess to, to uh, do well, but then as they grow older, they start to, they need to change the game, right? Because they can't dunk like they used to. They, so they maybe develop their jump shot better or they uh, become a three point shooter or a different type of specialist. So you have to adapt as your body ages. And this is also goes for when we talk about after your career. Right, you sometimes after a while you cannot play at this professional level, so you engage in these business endeavors. And Kobe, wow, he was an entrepreneur AF because he invested in so many things, uh, specifically also body armor. That thing, that enter, that drink that we see now is kind of like, I guess, what is that other one with the dragon fruit? Uh, vitamin water right it's similar to that but this it's growing even larger than that so it's beyond it's so being able to compensate for that loss right beyond uh i guess you see here being able to compensate for this loss right and select certain activities is the key right so adapt ability is really the key to this aging according to this optimal aging framework and next is this social emotional selectivity model of uh, aging this theory of aging and i've actually this has personal relevance for me because i almost drowned as when i was a kid i was like age 10 and it was strange i saw my life flash before my eyes and this theory kind of gets at it's not necessarily just at uh, older ages, but in general, if you start to see the end, right? The end of your life, you start to focus more on different goals, right? You start to focus more on emotional, your emotional needs as opposed to these learning needs. And we see here, this graph of social emotional selectivity theory, you see as these old, as you grow older, right? As you grow older, there starts to be this shift, right? This shift from becoming, uh, from these needs of, of knowledge to emotional needs. And, you, and this is why we see older adults have generally smaller social circles. And we see older adults start to, so smaller circles, all right? And, and less of these needs to learn new things. And, this actually is in also potentially informed by also biology, but in general, right? We, after we live this long life, we start to know the people we wanna be around, 
right? And being around those people and choosing to be around those people really provides us happiness, right? Or, or satisfy, provides us these positive emotions. Uh, if we find new people, it's a little more a dice roll, right? We might not know if they are going to fulfill these needs. And because the time horizon, right? It's all about the time, time horizon. If we start to see that there is an end, we start to focus more on these emotional needs. Uh, they've done studies with this for uh, AIDS, uh, people afflicted by AIDS, and also people who've gone through near-death experiences as well. But originally this was, uh, theory was postulated for the older adults, the shift from these, these uh, needs of knowledge to these more emotional needs as we age. And the reason why that successful aging framework and theory was so important because it spurned both that Baltus's work, but then also this whole general umbrella of positive aging. What are the things that go right during the aging process? So that's what uh, so when, that's what we talk about when we talk about positive aging, right? It's not just one thing. This is more of an umbrella of the science of what goes right during the aging process. This also encompasses the successful aging framework. But it's funny because when when is become when is one become old? Cut. So it's hard to tell throughout this process of when does become one become an adolescent and an adult? Uh, we could do it biologically, but especially nowadays, and we'll get into that later in the semester that emerging adulthood, right? This whole new life period is not quite an adult, fit, doesn't fit right in that category, but it doesn't fit into the category of being an adolescent. Like there's this middle period and we'll get a little into that during the later parts of the semester. So because society is changing and there's an emphasis on career, establishing yourself in career before you find a mate and uh, do all these quote-unquote adult things, especially when the focus is on your education and professional development, there are certain things that go by the wayside. But these might, especially for women, might conflict with the biology, right? The biological aging. So here's a little uh, clip about just even the difference between 29 and 31. In this song, we play the same woman two years apart. I'm 29. And I'm 31. This song is called 29, 31. For the first time in my life, I see it clearly. I realize the power of being a woman. 29 years old and time's on my side. I'm in my prime. I've hit my stride. I've got so much charisma and so many options. It's nice to always have my pick. There's nobody left. I'm all I'm at the top of my game, possibilities are endless, and I just feel really pretty. I'm holding up for someone who meets my standards, won't settle for anything less than perfect. I know what I want, and I can have it. I'm surrounded by love and peace. There's nobody left! I'm all alone! Why did I wait? What's wrong with me? In two short years, I'm gonna be 33. Who the hell will want me then? My ovaries are shrinking, I'm disgusting, and everyone feels bad for me. And I never get invited to dinner parties anymore. Things unfold when they're supposed to, cause everything happens for a reason. It'll happen for me when I'm not even looking. He'll just appear, and I'll just know, and he'll love me forever without any work. Who needs to try when things are meant to be? There's nobody left! I catch this, look at I'm me, all look alone. I'm smart and hot and have lots you're of interest. You're such an idiot! You think you're so special cause people He's tell you that attention. now, but that'll the stop if you replace your looks with pity! Complete. The world is a buffet of love. A la la la. Oh what? You think biological reality doesn't apply to you and your adorable cocoon of angelsness? Well it does. Well you're just waiting around and focusing on you. Guess what? You're gonna miss your fucking window! <laughs> Everything happens for a reason. You know I truly believe that. Yeah, you said that before. Oh my god, it does though. Everything happens for a reason. What about the Haitian earthquake or cellulite and skinny women? Just say, hey universe, I'm ready. It'll happen when you least expect it. Well, I don't expect it at all now, so I guess it's right around the corner. 
Maybe you're putting out the wrong vibe. Maybe you're closed off to love. Let me tell you a secret. It's called the secret. Here's another secret. You're an asshole. Your negativity is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The reason things go well for me is because of positivity. Well, I'm positive fertility always begins to atrophy when infantile fantasy eclipses true reality. It never once occurred to me that things will work out perfectly. When God closes a door, you see, he opens a window. You realize it's a smaller <laughs> opening, right? You used to be able to just walk out a door and I have to climb out some slightly door window somewhere, possibly falling like eight stories to your death. That is not an upgrade. You know what else? <laughs> There's nobody saying I'm alone. Because life is good. <laughs> I love that. So it was just society, as society changes, we start to see there's it start, the evidence, right, for certain theories such as emerging adulthood start to start piling on. You know? So this is why we're learning more and more about the, the aging process and new theories start to come into play and we will get into more of these theories especially of how Alzheimer's develops and uh, why the body breaks down and all these other theories that that kind of coalesces and houses how we think about the research questions and the research findings that occur. And then when we, so how do we build theories, right? How do we build theories and how do we build uh, the, upon these theories? A lot of it has to deal with uh, what we find, right? Observations in the world. And these observations are drive what these theories uh, how they're refined and if whether that certain concepts of the theory are supported or not supported. Whether theories apply now compared to not now, you know? So just think about if, if we were in the Victorian era, right? A lot of those theories don't apply. Like Freudian theories might not apply now because that was a society that was so, so much suppressing of sexuality, especially of women. So maybe those don't apply nowadays. So theories always get refined and they get refined through this scientific process. And what is the standard for gerontology are these methodology, uh, these, research me these research findings that are longitudinal. When we talk about longitudinal, it's, oh, I, the New York came out in me longitudinal, right? <laughs> it's it's beyond just one time point, right? Because we could get a snapshot of one time point. This is time zero, right? This is usually baseline, but we want to see whether it's these things hold up throughout the life course, right? It's time one, time two, time three. And this is the gold standard for theories on gerontology and aging because they provide this systematic uh, evaluation over a brief, uh, no, over the brief, a br uh, the opposite of a brief, over a, a longer period of time. Because let's just say, cross-sectionally, right? This is when we just take a snapshot of one thing at one time. This could be due to a variety of factors, right? This could be like the mood somebody was in, right? Or they were just, they, they lacked sleep that day, right? Or there's so many factors that happen if you just take a one snapshot. If we start to see this through time, the same, uh, behavior one, two, and three at these different time points, this really highlights, oh, we do have a phenomenon, but it is across time, or either it changes across time or is it stable across time. So this is why the standard, the gold standard, it should be the platinum standard, is longitudinal evidence. All right, and these longitudinal evidence really, it's the tracking of somebody over time. The, 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 and the and the Denunen study, Denunen and <laughs> the, the Denunen study, is this new New Zealand study that is like the gold. The I guess would it's not the gold. It's like the if 
it's the gold standard, the platinum standard, this would be like uh, the, the brands, right? This would be the study to show what it would look like if you could actually do that. And essentially what they, the Danoon study did is they tracked over a thousand people. And they tracked them from age, the, those early ages of three, five, and seven, and all the way until now to adulthood. They, uh, there's, there's 95% retention in this study because that's one of the big downfalls, pitfalls of these longitudinal studies. The people, that people, getting people at these different time points, it gets harder and harder and harder. They start to drop out. And the findings that you start to see later down the line, is it just because these people are a bias some way? Like, oh, maybe they just want to be part of your study. More, maybe they're more agreeable or they're just dead, right? They, I always gotta bring it there. <laughs> they, they just die and not able to continue on the study, right? Maybe they, the people who continue, there's a bias, right? Maybe they're healthier than the average person. A clip of the Zanunin study. What if we could take a baby and watch everything that happened to them from birth to grave? If we could examine every aspect of their life, look at everything that made them who they are, their genes, their physical well-being, their personality, their emotional ups and downs, criminal convictions, relationships, illnesses, successes, failures, the lot. Then imagine if we could do that for an entire city. Perhaps we could see or uncover what it is that really makes us all who we are. That experiment has already begun. It's probably the world's most successful longitudinal study of a general community sample ever. The Dunedin study is known in our field, in many fields, as a hallmark and landmark study. In 1972, a medical school from a small New Zealand city decided to take every one of the 1,037 children born that year and follow them for life. Those children have become the 1,000 most studied people in the world. For almost four decades, every aspect of their lives has been monitored in detail. The experiment is called the Dunedin Study, and it is now the broadest and most in-depth study of human beings in the world. If I had a list of the publications these world-class scientists and scholars have generated, I could probably go on for hours. It has become the richest and most productive archive of human development anywhere. It's an amazingly successful project, no question about it. Yeah, that requires a lot of coordination and a lot of money to do that. So this is one of the another pitfall of doing these longitudinal studies. It just requires so much more manpower and resources to run them. But they tell us so much about human development in general, but also part of the aging process. Well, and we will highlight a lot of these studies from these longitudinal studies <laughs> from uh, and then you hopefully you will get to play with some of that data. But what I ask you to do on Canvas is to, boom, design your own longitudinal study. So I want you to just one, pick a phenomenon, right? That you wanna study, phenomena, O, oh, phenomenon. It would be O and, right? Pick something that you want to study. For example, you want to study, uh, you are interested in studying uh, physical activity, exercise throughout the lifespan, right? To one, two, and three points, right? Let's just say in early, middle, and late life. So pick one and sh just describe how would that study what would your ideal study be, right? If you had all the money in the world, right? A million dollars a year to do this study, how would you design it, right? How would you design your longitudinal study? And just put it there and I want you to think about it. You know, some people might pick a couple, in the past couple of years, people wanted to do like creativity. How does creativity go throughout the lifespan. We'll talk a little about that. Uh, but also, there's anything that you're interested in, just pick that, right? Because this will be also just getting you thinking what do you want to write about in your term paper. So essentially just pick a phenomenon and then how would you 
design it, right? Design it with, you have a million dollars to do whatever you want. How many people would there be? How, what would you do? What would you test to try and get to understand this phenomenon more? So Canvas. We talked a little, that's the gold standard, the platinum standard, right? Longitudinal, tracking people across time. But sometimes that's not possible. You know, we are, have finite resources, especially in research, to try to understand a phenomenon. We could potentially just get people, right? We could get actually uh, a whole lot of people and survey them or, or assess them at one time point and be able to tell what the phenomenon is, right? Sometimes you don't need to invest in such a long, long, a uh, big longitudinal study. So what's called cross-sectional study, right? Is this like you measure, you, you get it at time one, right? And then you get variable one, what you want, then variable two, oh, what's it? That's a, wow, well, that's a, that's a next level. That's, let's just say two, variable three, level four. And then you start to do analysis, right? You, of, well, what's related to what, you know? Or you do an experimental design, right? Do you, you get, you get different age groups. Uh, let's just say young, middle, old and you do specific uh, experiments with them with these different ages and you can still tell a lot from this one snapshot in time right not everything needs to be longitudinal but we could tell differences within the aging process let's say in cognitive uh, cognition speed right a processing speed people we give people word problems or you give people certain problem sets and the younger people are able to solve them much faster than the older ones, right? Because they will get into that reasons why, uh, but but that could be done through this cross-sectional design, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be done through these longitudinal, large longitudinal uh, studies. So what they are is this one sh snapshot and pointing, comparing across groups. And you get to see a lot of research that's done this way just because one, it's easier, and two, some things don't require such long longitudinal uh, evidence. All right, and we we've also we've learned through many things throughout through these cross-sectional designs, such as people who are younger, right, are have less positive affects. You see down here, and as you grow older. Whoops, you, as you grow older, you start to develop, you, you start to have more positive affects, right? More positive emotions. Similarly, negative affects, right? Those negative emotions, they start to go down with, start to go down with uh, as you age. So this is when we see, we kind of, we conclude that people who, as they grow older, as they age, to older adulthood, they become more and more, um, have more positive emotions and less negative ones. I want you to design your own cross-sectional study. You could use the same phenomenon that you did with your longitudinal, but how would this look like cross-sectionally? Similarly, answer the questions like, who would be the target sample that you're interested in? Uh, how would you get your sample? And uh, what are the research questions that you want to answer and what are the potential drawbacks or benefits from your study from your study next we have this other methodology that combines these multiple studies uh, called the meta-analysis right essentially it is combining the effects of one the other studies and seeing what one because one study might find something different than another and put them all together to see the general effect of something one of the most powerful powerful resources to conduct uh, the secondary data stuff is through ipsr this is the essentially this is where all these national and publicly available data sets are housed in uh, Michigan's database. And they have a really great search function where you could really get data for any of the phenomenon that you are interested in. Also, you can get a snapshot of what is going on in somebody's day-to-day -day through this 
what's called experience sampling method or uh, ESM. Uh, in public health, it would be called ecological momentary assessment. Essentially, this gets at your present experience. You know, what, what are you doing at that certain time? And how do we measure that systematically? So think about, it used to be where that you would get random beeps where people had those beepers and you would have a piece of paper or a booklet and you would fill that out when you got beeped. Nowadays, people just get notified through the cell phone and start taking a survey, boop, 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 right uh, uh, at that moment, right? And this gets at these different snapshots of your day. So that's uh, ESM. So most of those, what we just talked about, analyze numbers, right? Numbers and how those relate to answering research questions. But we could also systematically analyze words, which would be under this umbrella of qualitative study. And qualitative studies include interviews, uh, life review interventions, like providing themes, and focus groups as well, right? So we can analyze systematically words. So it's not just analyzing, but it's also collecting, right? Systematically these uh, through protocols and structured or semi-structured interviews. What are certain themes that arise? So just think about there's a quantitative part, but then there's also this qualitative part, analyzing the words systematically. We also could combine, right, what is called mixed methods, both quantitative and qualitative uh, methods. One of, the, one of the great studies on aging, which is called the Nun Study, uh, has also done this and really provided us a lot of insight on current activities and happiness and brain health. Hilltop in rural Minnesota stands the convent of the School Sisters of Notre Dame. It might look like a house of rest. Inside, it's anything but. Three, two, <laughs> From dusk to dawn, the sisters are active, both physically, 29, 30, and mentally. China is the most powerful communist nation in the world. And living very long lives. These are the names of 28 sisters in this building who are over 90. And you've got six sisters who are over 100. So how is it that these sisters live such long, active, and lucid lives when many people 20, 30, even 40 years younger fall into decline with failing bodies and fading minds? That's a question researcher David Snowden has spent more than a decade trying to answer. These are, in many ways, super nuns that had probably very good genes, wonderful upbringing, a good, clean, active, giving life. Sister Esther has been at the convent since she retired six years ago, at the age of 96. I'm 102. I'm going to be 103 in December. Do you feel 102? Sometimes I feel 200. <laughs> Sister Esther is one of the participants in the Nun Study, in which each of the sisters has agreed to donate her brain to research. When people hear we willed our brains to them, they say, ooh, you did. <laughs> well, then, what good to us after we die? The goal is to learn more about how conditions like Alzheimer's disease develop. In studying dozens of brains, Snowden made a remarkable discovery. About half the sisters are mentally normal when they die. And what is quite surprising to us is we find a significant number of them have full-blown Alzheimer's disease in their brain, yet are acting normally. The question is, if so many sisters' brains show evidence of Alzheimer's, why do so few of them have any of the memory loss and physical failings that are characteristic of the disease? The answer may have something to do with how active their minds are, even into old age. They tell me that if you work puzzles, you don't, you can keep your mind active. So I puzzle. Sister Jane Francis is 95. You've got to keep thinking. Oh, I'm young. 87-year-old Sister Clarissa likes to follow baseball. But I've been a sport fan all my life. 103-year-old Sister Mathia keeps focused by knitting. If you don't uh, keep your mind on this thing, you might slip one and have trouble later on. Many of these older sisters have something in common besides longevity. They were teachers with a college education. 
we found that the the higher educated sisters had a better chance of living to old age, and once they got to old age, that the higher educated sisters had better mental and physical function. Snowden believes that's because the better developed a person's brain is early in life, the better able it is to fight off degenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's later on. Poor mental function obviously is not inevitable. You can see that just by walking around the place. It may also have to do with the fact that the nuns live in a supportive community and not alone, and they have deep religious faith both of which have been shown to lower the chances of developing heart disease and stroke. What researchers are wondering is, just how long will these women live? I might, might live a little bit longer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what God wants. Yeah. What the nuns seem to show is, how old your body and mind are doesn't matter. It's how active you have kept them for all of your life. In Mankato, Minnesota, I'm John Roberts for Eye on America. Yeah, and these, these nun studies have really told us a lot about the aging brain and how behavior is able to modify it. And we'll get a little into that uh, in the, throughout the semester, but there's this cognitive reserve theory, right? Being able to build your reserves, right? Through activities, enriching activities, education, and that actually uh, could help prevent in terms of the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So if you just think about this, right? Think of this as an axon. Alzheimer's disease is an actual pathology, right? To block those, that main pathway from, from you functioning. But if you gauge in cognitive uh, reserve, you gauge in these alternative uh, activities, right, enriching activities, you find these side roads, right? And it's all part of functioning, right? So even though this main road might be blocked with pathology, right, these, these uh, plaques and tangles, you're still able to function through these side roads, right? This also gets to the SOC model, right? The selection, optimization, and compensation, right? Compensation through these other pathways. So this is just a theory, but there's a lot of support for the cognitive reserve uh, theory. So this is, we'll get into that throughout the semester, but that's just like one of the, the findings that, that these, this NUN study has highlighted. So we could analyze the, the numbers, we could analyze the words, but we could also analyze observations, right? We usually do this through ethnographic uh, data, right? So you could study observations, right? How do people just normally behave and code that? You know, you usually you put them in a situation or you could do it naturalistically. So this, these uh, observational studies really uh, brought light to the abuse that, uh, elder abuse that people used to experience, oh, well, they still experience in uh, some of these homes. But that was, a lot of that was done systematically through these observations of like surveillance cameras. So, so you're able to analyze words, numbers, and observation. Right, and you would normally, what it's called, you would triangulate, right? To make something really strong, uh, a strong case for something. And, and now in days, beyond just the, the words, numbers, uh, and observations, you're all, we have another dimension, right? And this is me at what UC Irvine, it's spit camp, right? There's also these bio, markers are called, right? And Spit Camp essentially, they taught us how to analyze uh, saliva samples. And it's not just about stress, like course hold, what everybody thinks about. There are other things that you could gain from uh, the fluids, right? Spit especially, because spit is easily more accessible than drawing blood. But so we could collaborate all of this stuff with these certain biomarkers as well. Okay, so we're complete. We have learned about the, the trends of aging experience and how to talk about those trends with the terminology and where those trends are going. And now we've learned to evaluate the, the science behind it all. 
and uh, the evidence and how do we continue the science through the theory, development, and empirical evidence. We know that the world is just changing. People are living so much longer and healthier than ever. And we start to see the formulation of these new ages, with specifically the third and fourth age, and even this emerging adulthood, which we'll get into. Uh, these theories of aging, right? They, they're always, they're changing and they're getting refined, but they are also the, the cornerstone of how we generate questions that are testable and be, how do we explain these, uh, these results of this aging. And through these research designs, right, well, this is how we, we keep all of this, uh, this, this enterprise going of science, right? We find out new and new things about the aging process. And this is really exciting because there's, like we said before, there's so many more older adults now than ever before in society. So learning about this, uh, how the aging process from them really kind of influences all the stuff that we know, you know, how to modify it, how to intervene, and potentially how to become better at the aging process. Thank you for joining me on learning the terminologies, the, the trends, and the science behind this whole study of gerontology. And this is, you'll see how this is so valuable to just understanding not only your older adults that you care about, but also yourself, right? There, this is a, there's a science behind it, this whole aging process. And it's, the science is getting refined and refined. And you become a more critical consumer of this information once you understand the the, the level of empirical evidence there is, or some, is something hearsay or something just, uh, just, just supported by science. So I hope you enjoyed this and uh, always I will see you next time. Damn, I ain't pick on a psycho Little mama bad like Michael Can't really trust nobody With all this jewelry on you My roof look like a no-show Got diamonds by the bolo Come with the Tony Homo For clowns and all the balls I ain't pick on a psycho Little mama bad like Michael Can't really trust nobody With all this jewelry on you My roof look like a no-show Got diamonds by the bolo Don't act like you my friend When I'm rolling through my hands oh. You stuck in the friend zone Four, five to fifth, ayy Hundred bands inside my shorts to chino the shit, ayy Try to stuff it all in, but it don't even fit, ayy Know that I've been